how in-game tokens are empowering communities and individuals online. Yep. With your host, Ross Krasner of Ryu Games. Take it away, fellas. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I want to just first uh, give everybody an opportunity to briefly introduce themselves. Thank you. Uh, ben Cousins, I lead business development for Zebedee. Uh, I've got a background in games development originally, later moved into finance and venture capital, uh, where I actually invested in Zebedee and then wound up becoming so bullish I joined. Hello, Patrick McGrath. Uh, traditionally in mobile gaming, but founding a new company that's mobile centric and leveraging uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, I'm Christopher Stuckey. I'm the senior product marketing manager for Jam City on their new blockchain game, Champions Ascension. Okay. Everyone is so short. Um, this is Ray. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder and uh, managing partner of Gloom Cruise Capital. Uh, before I started this fund, um, I actually is the uh, VP of Gumi Inc. That's a public mobile gaming company in Japan. Um, I, my, my involvement in, in the uh, blockchain and, and Web3 games is more from the investor point of view, obviously. Um, so yeah, that's... Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so the way I see it is there's three types of tokens in games right now that are used. Uh, there's governance tokens, utility tokens, and NFTs, non-fungible tokens. I want to start by talking just about governance tokens, uh, where player, players own some portion of the game, whatever that means. I want to start with the question, what is the vision? What is the ultimate goal of these governance tokens in five years, best case scenario? What does that look like? <laughs> so it's really hard to prognosticate anything in crypto. I don't know if anybody knows what crypto looked like five years ago. So it's really hard to figure out what it's going to be in five years from now. But I think what the, the end goal is, if, if crypto, uh, you know, people have their way, is that we will see DAOs, as you mentioned, governance tokens be a way that many projects are coordinated, uh, grown, uh, new ones launched. Many people are looking at uh, different systems by which their governance token might could be used for other products so they might could essentially use a governance token on a new game that's not even one that they made but they accept that in their game and i think that's kind of the goal a lot of products that you see out there from some of the bigger companies like gala games they want to be uh, having people utilize their system their token economy in products that they make in the future and i think that's probably what a lot of we'll see a lot of success around the you know, governance tokens in models of like that, because I think there's probably the most money in being a publisher uh, for a lot of products like that. Yeah, so, um, you know, f from a uh, kind of a gaming kind of development point of view, um, to be honest, my, my feeling is uh, making the assets cross games, especially as not belong to the same studio is pretty hard. Uh, it's, it's, if you think about the, the genres of games and also the stage of the, the games are different, uh, when, you, when you accept it, another game's assets is basically it's impossible. Otherwise, they're going to ruin your own game. Uh, what I feel, the, if you talk about governance, um, what basically you're voting for, um, the game, if you hand over the tokens to the game, gamers, they're probably more interested about what the game story is going after. So for the same game, what's the next step? Um, how the uh, kind of uh, the, the next phase of the game can be can be um, where the their own gaming assets should be, you know, utilized or um, um, I don't know, and probably also the how the in-game economy kind of uh, economic benefits being distributed between different party uh, participants. Um, those are probably the angles. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd say uh, of the three that you mentioned, I'm probably the most skeptical of governance uh, hitting the idealistic kind of state in which a lot of people look at it. Um, just from uh, regulations possibly getting in the way, uh, but also the way in which you are kind of promising a very real and tangible, uh, I guess, 
opportunity or right to people to have a say in you developing these games. And that's not a, a terrible thing, um, depending on how you message and allow that right to manifest and you know come to fruition. But I think uh, this, at least from my view, this is, <laughs> as, as you already mentioned, five years from now, who knows? Uh, I'm sure like smarter people than, than me will figure this out, but this is the one that I'm most skeptical about. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things um, that's really important to do in crypto is just generally demystify terms and what they mean. Uh, and, you know, I think governance tokens, the, the clue is really in the name. It's about governance, right, which, which ultimately comes down to voting rights. And I think that's why, as we were just discussing outside, like the regulation piece becomes a really serious question, because if you're putting voting rights on something, it really looks like a security. I don't know if anyone in the room has done a securities exam uh, or two, but it, you know, essentially it comes down to um, promotion of tokens, uh, say in the matter who's, who's, who is uh, the ultimate beneficiary and whether or not it's an investment contract. And once you start allowing uh, users to vote on the usage of the tokens in the treasury, for example, that sure looks like a company choosing how to spend its money, uh, which looks like shares. So I think the regulatory piece is the key question there, and the uh, SEC is definitely making noises that would suggest governance tokens are gonna come under their purview, um, which I think puts a serious limitation on the kind of uh, exciting worldview that maybe your community could you know, choose the direction of your game. That's a, that's a very different kind of voting right, and I don't know if you need a token for that or just a poll in your Discord. So that leads into what we were talking earlier about community building before the game is launched. Uh, and a lot of, of NFT sales have been uh, good at building community and people literally invested into the product. Um, how do you think these games can live up to the expectations though? Uh, after an NFT sale has been made, two years in development, uh, someone's already bought into the game, how, how can these games live up to those types of expectations? And is this the model that should be moving forward when a game is first thought of? You sell some of the characters and people buy in. Well, I mean, this is a, definitely a subject that a lot of people will have very strong opinions on, one way or the other. Uh, what I think I can say pretty safely is that um, it has been a successful mechanism for a lot of games to raise funds in order to hire people to develop the game. It's been used a lot by a lot of different communities to do that. And usually, I think it was pointed out when we were talking again in the hall, you know, a lot of projects, unlike a traditional business, they need to build a community first before they build the product. And I think that's true even for more established players. You have to build, in order to bring it into this community, this community being the crypto enthusiast community, for that community to adopt your product, your project, one of the metrics that a lot of the community looks for is how big is the community? And one of the factors that people buy into any product, any project is, you know, is the community engaged and can it something that I can join? So it's, it's almost the opposite of what you might see in a traditional game environment, game world, because it precedes the actual development in almost every circumstance I can think about. So there is the aspect of building community first. Uh, but I think really what you're like hinting at or kind of like going in the direction is the, the how do you have the utility uh, last within these like early token sales? I know there's like, I'm so, <laughs> not, not the biggest fan of land sales either, but I understand that there is some utility depending on the type of game that you're uh, trying to build. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of really having, a, you know, like some founder's card, some founder's token, wh whatever this looks like, where you're offering uh, such great utility to come in at an early stage because, yes, it is risky, right? You're, you're investing uh, time, money, energy into something that might not actually launch. And so making sure that there is this utility that is backed by this uh, early, uh, really investment by the, the player or user. Um, 
and making sure that that doesn't get devalued over time. I mean, of course, scarcity is always like one of the major pillars, making sure that you're not uh, uh, over promising things um, and really just like under promise over delivered towards these players. But you know, utility such as like the airdrops for, for some of these early players and making sure that this uh, golden cohort it stays engaged uh, like really becomes like these uh, game evangelists of like they are finding people to bring into the community uh, because this is just really what is necessary because you have to build this community before you even have the product. Um, yeah, so um, I, I think you know no matter what kind of tokens you're selling at the beginning, it, it is a fundraising. Um, process, right? You're not, you don't have a game yet uh, from an investor point of view. Uh, we want to see what the game is, where this assets will be utilized. You know, simply having a, a photo, having a picture, very beautiful. Um, all of the behaviors on the market right now is more, it's all from the speculative uh, point of view. Um, so I think, you know, that I'm not saying that's a bad thing, you know, as you know, uh, Chris just mentioned, you know, you do need uh, the, the initial capital to hire people to starting to build out, build out that. Um, and uh, it's, it is a good way for you to starting to build a community before you're really actually having a game. But still, the fundamental thing is uh, when you have the capital, how you actually create a game that the all these specific NFTs, the assets have a very meaningful utility inside the game. Having the asset itself is not the purpose. Having the assets in order to play the game that actually should be the purpose of the uh, of the whole design. And um, holding the asset itself shouldn't bring too much of the value to you. Actually, how you how you use it inside of the game, what kind of your in-game behavior actually should be the the parts that I know really rewarded. Um, that's what I think. Uh, I think I, Patrick, you made a really good point. I agree with strongly, which is there's this, there needs to be this heavy focus on utility, which obviously a lot of people in this room will have heard to death. Um, and you know, I, and I also think it's very interesting to observe the language people use because you used it too. And I and I think it's um, it's really important to understand what NFTs are technologically speaking. So if you use words like investment, and I don't want to be the person on this panel who just constantly is like, the regulators are going to come. But if you use words like investment, you're implying that there is a return right to be made. You're implying the expectation of future profits. That's like te pillar number three of the Howey test on what is a security. Um, so you have to be really careful, which means you have to give real utility. Why do we not think of NFTs as purchases, not investments, i.e. you buy a skin, you buy this collectible, and then when you arrive in the game world, because you made all of these pre-purchases which helped fund the game's development, uh, you have now all of this stuff upon arrival. And I think a, a lot of games developers have kind of got to that place and are now building like that, but this this logic that you know NFTs are these mythical creatures that can do amazing things is is a really ridiculous way of looking at something which is fundamentally a receipt. It is a it is the hash of a transaction. You know, it's it just says you bought this. I like to think of them like ticket stubs. Like if you went to see Prince in concert, and I'm a big Prince fan, he di he died. I have all of my Prince ticket stubs as sort of my claim to having seen him live. That's a good way I think to think of NFTs, and they might include image links or video links with the receipt, so you can go and look at stuff. Um, but I think we should be very careful about advertising them as something that you invest in and expect a return on. That, that to me is just a, a really, it's mismarketing. It's, it's not an ethical way of selling a product. Yeah, I mean, I, I would add that uh, at least from, yes, you, using the, the word uh, investment is not ideal, especially given the, the current uh, regulatory environment uh, and, and looking into it. Anyway, uh, one of the things I, I would, I probably should have clarified was like utility that is like in game because ideally like, you're making a video game, right? Like the people should be excited to play this thing. Uh, it, it, right now where we're at, uh, we did have a lot of individuals using games as a use case of blockchain technology. And now we are, you know, kind of, uh, really a lot of eyes opened in this room and wanting to uh, jump in there, 
and do games properly with blockchain backed technology. So yeah, a good point about using uh, uh, proper words, but I just kind of wanted to clarify about uh, utility being mainly in game and of course not the promise of, hey, earn a bunch of money from this. I, I wanted to mention one thing I think that a lot of people on, on their minds comes to mind when we think about this question, which is if they have a game, should they add some kind of crypto component to it? And then there's a lot of products, a lot of games in the news that have kind of been covered where they tried to bring crypto to an existing game audience they had. And, and that has not worked time and time again. And, and what, what I think what we're starting to see, as you were kind of hinting at there in your, in your most recent point, which is um, bringing games to the crypto community. It might be helpful to think of the crypto community like another console or another audience where you're trying to make a game because there's clearly an audience already there, and so you're trying to make a game for that audience. And it's kind of the, the way that some companies have gone about it, it's a little bit more harsh where they're like trying to force their existing game players onto a new system and they don't want to move and they don't like what they're doing and they don't like the way it's working. And I think when we talk about working with the crypto community, we're talking about, again, not an investment. We're talking about a game that happens to be on blockchain, but it should be a game first. Uh, quick, I'm just curious, quick poll of the room. Uh, who, where's your hand if you own an NFT in here? And how many of you use that NFT in a game or expect to use an NFT in a game? Pretty, pretty large amount. I guess I'm curious, like, what's wrong with investing in an in-game asset? What, what's wrong with hoping that the price goes up? As regulatory regulations aside, like, why is that not a, why isn't that not an encouraged part of the future world of gaming? Um, I, I'm qu not quite um, I agree on what you just explained. So NFT is not just an investment, as I mentioned just um, earlier. So NFT should be one of the assets that you need in order to have the in-game experience. I think. Part part of it actually I agree with uh, just now the the ticketing kind of uh, 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 comment right you have that in order to enter into that game but that's just part of it when you think about the the nature of a NFT as an in-game asset actually you can trace all the behaviors inside the game so if it's that's in-game item you can have you can know where it's been minted find it how that been used what kind of features you have it and how you upgrade it in the past who upgraded it, right then all those features can make that item more interesting when you use it in the game you fight with people you fight with uh, let's say you're in the rpg game kind of uh, scenario you use a weapon fighting with monster how many times is it have you maintained it have you combined it with other assets right how you upgrade that make it more powerful so I think NFTs, the natures of it, actually make it very interesting in-game assets that you can utilize and make it in-game experiences very interesting. And having purchasing in it itself, it shouldn't be the kind of an investment behavior, but rather you just want to having the in-game experiences that you like, and you like to spend more money on making this NFT assets even stronger. So I, I think that should be well, at least from my personal point of view, that should be the right way to think about how this NFT should be utilized in the games. I was, I was going to say, I think that's a, a really good point. Like, what's wrong with that? I don't, I don't think there, there's anything wrong with it. I think one of the most, for me, like one of the most compelling uh, ideas behind NFTs, at least as in my own, the way I play games, is like, uh, provenance, which I think was just touched on. Like if um, I was a massive CS player, as I'm sure some people in the room were back in the day, and, and I always like to think if I could have had Gooseman's AK-47 skin, you know, and, and, I, and I could provably show that was the creator of CS 1.4 or 1.5, whatever, that was, the, that was their gun, and I've got it now, and that went on. There's loads and loads of evidence in games to show that that happens without blockchain anyway, right? People, people attach value to things because of their legendary status, because they, uh, there is an innate desirability to something that is not financially motivated. So I think that that's, like, that there is nothing wrong with, with these things happening. I think what it, what it highlights is the, um, 
UX challenge around things in the blockchain space. Uh, you know, really, what you're talking, about, what you really want is seamless uh, value transfer, the ability to pay, you know, change the asset, etc., in a game environment. Ideally, with like the, everything behaving how we're used to online purchases happening today. You know, you, you double tap your Apple Pay thing, scan your thumb, and then you've got the asset, and then you can move on. And we're a, we're a long, long way from that, uh, and in in large part due to the fact that these uh, the chains themselves are competing with one another to try and get game developers on board because they're inherently not interoperable, and they will talk about being interoperable, but they're not, because if you can accept uh, ETH on Solana, for example, what is the value of Solana? It's it's like the, there's no motivation in the game theory of blockchain economics to for one chain to support another, unfortunately. And when there's bridges between chains, uh, those are well-known security risks. They're, they're usually the stuff of engineering fantasy. And if any of you saw the wormhole hack uh, between Solana and Ethereum, you'll understand why, but it, it happens all the time. So I think you know when you look at solutions like Coinbase NFT, Kraken NFT, FTX, crypto, whatever, you know, whatever product is out there, what they're fundamentally solving is the ability to actually have a seamless payment experience to buy this collectible or this asset that you can use in a game. Uh, and I think that is still the piece in this whole ecosystem that is that is pretty broken. Like it, it's very hard to actually make the experience of having all of this seamless asset transfer occur. And it it's tied to loads of stuff. It's tied to money transmission requirements from a regulation perspective. It's tied to the fact that dealing with blockchains is like dealing with internet level plumbing. Uh, it's you know the fact that the NFTs don't speak to one another. There's there's tons of stuff to still clear through. And in that sense, that's why we are. Uh, very much just at the beginning of all of this. Uh, and keep in mind that, you know, when free-to-play gaming came along uh, with Zinger and Farmville and Flash, you know, it, it took 10 years to get to Clash of Clans. People don't think about that, but it did. Even though everyone knew about free-to-play for years and years and years, it took a long time for the model to actually click, and then you had a 1,000 developers able to scale free-to-play. Uh, we're still very early stage when it comes to this whole space. So I guess one of the things I want to say, why is it bad to say it's kind of an investment? Because we're changing gameplay behavior based on what the earning potential is. And I think that might be a reason. If you're trying to design a game, what's fun may not be the most profitable thing to do, but people might do the most profitable thing if it's, a, if it's an investment. And when we think about what we're trying to do with, with Jam City, we're trying to make a fun game. Right. It's not necessarily something that's meant to be purely a security asset or purely an investment. It's supposed to be a game, first and foremost. And it happens to have functions and utility tokens as a part of that. That's part of on the Web3. Uh, and then, and, you know, what we can say is that hopefully we have a game that, uh, you know, many, many, many people can enjoy, whether they're into crypto or not. That's that's the goal. You know, we want to have a strong community. We want to have a community of gamers. And I think that's kind of the ideal goal because going back to what's already been talked about here, I like the description of it's being almost a UX problem. And in, in, a, in a way, like I, I think about like when people were first designing motion controls for the Nintendo Wii and they were just shoehorning in into existing games. And it was really terrible because they didn't, they were, the game wasn't built for the motion controls, but they tried to make it happen and it was just a bad experience. And that was ultimately a UX problem. It took some people specifically designing the game to use the motion controls to do it. And I think we're going to have to see the same thing for crypto. Crypto assets, the functionality that was mentioned here earlier about tracking where something can be, the idea that you could own a specific celebrity's product that's something you can't do you can own a copy of it but now you could theoretically own the exact one and that's something that games need to be designed around in order to incorporate because those are value propositions for the game player themselves that can only happen realistically on an environment either imitating or being crypto itself i'd actually just like to uh build on that um for the next topic which is utility tokens and play and earn um Obviously, we talked about it backstage. Axie Infinity is the best known example to start. Um, it didn't, playing their game, it doesn't feel like people are, the retention and their user metrics fit the level of fun that I had playing the game. I think it really is largely due to uh, people being able to earn money in the game. Is that just part of what gaming is gonna look like in the future? When you can earn money, it will just become a job for some people. Is that what we want? Or is this a side effect of playing? 
what are your thoughts? Is, is Axie Infinity V1, this is only for, for making money, and V2 is a fun game where you happen to be making money? Or is V2, some people are having fun and some people are doing it as a job? I mean, it almost it touches back on, I don't think you'll ever get rid of the speculators. At the same time, you will not get rid of those approaching games uh, as a means of earning uh, you know, monetary benefits, especially the way in which uh, crypto games will open up uh, really the, the flow of capital. One of the interesting things about Axie Infinity, more than the game itself, was that there was actually some job issues in Philippines because people essentially stopped showing up to work because they could make so much money playing this game. By Western standards, they weren't making, you know, 100K or 200K a year, uh, but they were making more than they, they were, you know, doing their normal job, right? I think I remember reading about a teacher shortage, right? So I think that there is kind of a global possibility of redistribution of wealth. Of course, this is not like the, the socialist kind of ideals of how, uh, I, I don't know, Marx would talk about it, but you know, there is a, an ability to earn by playing a video game that all you need is an internet connection. And I think this is really interesting because you will have a lot of user bases from a lot of these developing countries that can approach a game and say, hey, you know what, I can earn 10 bucks an hour, and that is 10x what I make in a day. So, of course, I will play this game as a job. Um, um, I, I think, you know, Axe Infinity or the other, you know, play-to-earn games, that's a good experiment um, from that angle to say. Um, it just a cr bring in another group or another type of players into the this whole gaming ecosystem that you're just doing it at, as a job. Um, but fundamentally, I think that model can be, can, can be a part of the whole gaming system, but it will never become the main gaming system because not everyone want to earn money. And uh, when everyone want to earn money, who's actually paying the money? So eventually games are entertainment. You, the target user, the real target user, are the ones that will spend money inside of the game. That's where all the inflows of the game come from. And the the play so, so called play play to earn part type of the players, they can be part of the X system. They can be their behaviors can make the uh, pay to play uh, basically the players who want to spend money uh, make their in game experience more fun, so that they will would like to pay more money. Uh, just a very simple uh, example, if you play a, uh, a MMORPG game and when you jump into the world, you realize there's nobody there, nobody talking to you, nobody, nobody playing with you, what are you going to do with it? That, that game doesn't fun at all. Then there will be players coming in earlier, creating things, fighting together with you, uh, sending things to you, making your in-game experiences much fun, then you would like to spend money spend more time inside of the game, then you will spend more money inside of the game. See, there's a there's a balance between the different type of gamers. So I think play to earn is totally fine, especially considering if all in the future, uh, the NFT, all the in-game assets become owned by some specific person, then you can imagine that's more like a real world, right? You, you, you're living in the real world, you're doing transactions, uh, playing, not, not playing, but uh, doing everything together with other players, everyone's serve a role inside of the game, then it's okay for someone to earn, for someone to consume, right? Um, so th that's kind of... Now, I, I think a lot of uh, us up here are in a lot of agreement overall on the concept. What what I will say, and I'll try to keep it brief because I know you're going to have another question. We When we look at what we're trying to actually do with the idea of games, if it becomes a job, it's not a game anymore. It's a job. So, you know, ideally you can have the ability to make some money for sure. That would be ideal. I'm not saying that, you know, that's a guarantee, but the idea that you could, I think the more important aspect that you're doing is actually ownership of what you invest in the game. You invest your time in your game and you own those assets and theoretically those assets might have value beyond just the experience you have in the game. I think that's the broader vision of crypto more than 
more than making it a job, it's to provide a value, additional value to gamers. I think that's what the goal is. Can I make a last comment? So uh, I think the, the, most of the examples I want to use is more on a, from an RPG type of game because that's more easy. The thing about you, you playing a RPG game that you need to fight, you need a sword, and uh, a lot of games, uh, actually, you can design it in a way all the sword, all the weapons need maintain and maintenance. Right, you need to uh, every every weapon have only can it only be used at, let's say ten to twenty times. Every time you use it, the the capability of it is just dropping down, and you need to re maintain it. And it it naturally need a job position that players can serve as the maintenance people for you. And do by doing that, they they got a fee for that. So um, I, I mean, when you make the game, design the game in a way works like that. Then you, there is ways that you can monetize it inside of the game. That people, part of people, are playing for fun, just experiencing the whole entertainment experience. Another type of person just contribute to make those type of people, the other type of people, having enjoyed their life, enjoyed their life in that virtual world. I think if we look at uh, blockchain gaming is as what are the two big things it's delivered I, I think one is yeah ownership and and the other is uh, in its simplest form bi-directional value transfer so the players aren't simply paying in now there's also the ability to withdraw uh, if you enable withdraw you are I think no matter how hard you try to avoid it you're going to have people who, who treat the game as a job and who start grinding because they can earn from it um, particularly if you have global distribution so I think as an industry, we need to think very carefully about exploitation and labor law. Um, you know, in the same way that social casinos rise, brought about a few uncomfortable questions for the industry about what is excessive exploitation of a player. You know, if you're asking them to pay in endlessly to a slot machine that rewards them in worthless game currency, is that just like the the most hellish version of Vegas ever. Um, you know, th it's the same thing here. If you've got if you've got someone grinding their life away, uh, playing a game to earn a few cents an hour, that's a very depressing uh, reality. You know, cr created inadvertently or not. So we need to we need to think about that carefully. And it's it's why when I think about utility tokens, I think if you're promising the player the ability to earn, uh, why aren't you just giving them money? Why does it have to be a token? If you can use stable coins, you can use money, uh, you know, and, and that is the same thing, but better, and without tax questions, without uh, also without more headaches for the game developer. If you have to prop up your token because you're playing, the players are withdrawing it all the time to go buy food and stuff. You know, why are you then? tripling the issuance, uh, doing a temporary buyback because the stock tanked, uh, you know, doing like you're, you're no longer giving players money and your job as a games developer suddenly turns from like maintaining the game to basically uh, managing your, your market, which is, I don't think a lot of games developers want to do that. So I think games developers, if they want that earn mechanic, there are plenty of solutions out there and you know, I'm not, don't want to go in some shill path, but this is exactly what we do. You know, you can pay users money and if you use, tokens with deep liquidity that you don't alter the supply for or have a role in in the issuance of, you can pay it out as freely as your game design will allow uh, and you can use regulated rails, you can get that money into people's bank accounts and you can let them earn in a manner that is much more respectful of them as an individual. Can I just jump up at this point? That's an amazing session. There must be some questions. Do we have any questions from, step right up to the mic. If only we had hours. Hello. Yeah, hi. My question is that uh, one of the new ways of monetization for games in blockchain is uh, royalties on peer-to-peer -peer trading in perpetuity. So how big do you think that model is going to be in terms of for the game developers to monetize their games now? What's the new, new, well, well, could you repeat that again? What's the So now, model? now games can earn through royalties perpetually uh, on the peer-to-peer -peer trade that will happen for the in-game assets. Uh, uh, earlier, so, they so could you, Sorry, uh, just to clarify, you're saying that the developers can now have a monetization scheme in which the royalty aspect has essentially infinite uh, runway. So you have a longer tail for monetization. This is what the question is yes, fundamentally. Yes. Yeah, this is super exciting. 
right? Because free to play is really trying to find your monetization funnel, right? Because it, at the end of the day, it's CPI versus LTV. Like we need LTV. We need to create these models, you know, monetization as quickly as possible. So now there's a massive shift because that long tail, just from having a healthy secondary uh, uh, economy of, in the secondary market of people trading things and having that, you know, small percentage royalty. I think this is incredibly interesting and will certainly, while unproven, I think that there's like a lot of promise for how you can design games. And from a monetization standpoint, for, as a developer, uh, really kind of takes a lot of pressure off like pushing users to spend, right? Because ideally it's how, how can you shroud that <laughs> and make it as, as gentle as possible to, to speak openly. Um, I just want to add one thing. So um, um, yes, there will be secondary market trading. Uh, you will earn c continuously income from that side. But if you uh, know it about um, uh, Diablo 3, they do have in-house uh, auction house, right? People can trading assets within there. And it's trading, actually the behavior is very active but they actually turn it off because it's actually ruining the game. People are focusing on trading rather than playing the game. So how you balance that, make the game actually even fun, fun, more fun, and people will spend more energy on that. And part of that experience is actually people can swap assets with each other to make the in-game in experiences even um, stronger. That actually should be the way that you think about the monetization. Still, the monetization still should become uh, issuing the assets, people spending m money inside of the game should be their primary um, monetization, uh, I believe. Awesome. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you kind of answered my question a little bit with your Diablo 3 example, but I'm seeing this polarization towards um, descent towards the pay to win kind of mindset and and when you guys talk about um evolving nfts um kind of being able to create value and then and then trade that value it's going to be top heavy to the to the whales right um these these people that can spend to get the most amount of um, value and advantage in their game and i think um it's an interesting conversation because it sounds like the the opposite of this uh, competitive integrity um, um, polarization I'm seeing for like Lost Ark, for example, talking about more MMOs coming out and um, the sensitivity around people being being able to spend a lot of money to, to get these accelerated experiences through all the content. Um, so I guess my question is, how do you guys, uh, if, you, if you put yourself in the position of the designer um, to create compelling evolving NFTs without it stinking like a, a pay to win experience where, where kind of the gap is so big um, that it, it kind of makes it feel like a job and less of a, a game, right? Um, I think there's a kind of two, two type of, uh, it depends on the type of the game, obviously. If it's a peer to peer, uh, you know, fight battling game, it's very easily to become a, get into a pay to win uh, style. Um, so then in that case, most of the monetization should be on the cosmetics, so um, the people continue their appearance, but all the uh, spend money making them looking even cooler. Or, um, but but the eventual gameplay should still be a sp skill based. While if it's a uh, kind of an RPG game, um, then the, you know, paid to win is not really a thing because. Uh, um, people enjoying from you know level zero going up to a level 100 they spend so much time in that and the value they get is actually the in-game uh, entertainment experience so they are okay to sell that whole you know achievement 100 uh, level character to a new party who want to pay a lot of money for them but what that they get is just the character. They can continue playing that, but they, they lose all these uh, past experiences that they, they have. So it's, it's fine for in, in that type of situation. One more, sorry guys, there's just one, one, one more answer from you, you guys on the stage. No more time for questions. I'm really sorry. Do catch up with the fellas after this though. Anybody else want to, want to uh, finish off? I'll just speak very quickly, which is uh, <laughs> the answer to that question. Uh, the idea behind any game economy is that you want to try to structure it for the most accessibility. 
So if you end up designing something that's so rare that people do play pay to win, essentially, and have to pay a lot of money, and that person now has godlike powers because of that, then that's a wrong game economy. That's a wrong game design standpoint. So I would just say that you would need to design a game that doesn't do that at, at, at the end of the day. And it has to be thought, and it, and it has to be an intention from the game design aspect. Cool. Fantastic fellas. Christopher, Patrick, Ben, Ray, Ross. Give a big hand to these fellas.